It seemed at this point that the whole outcome of the fighting depended on good trucks and drivers with the ability to keep them rolling day and night. We had to get there fastest with the most. In 1944, Gerald Keane was one of hundreds of thousands of men invading Europe. He helped to win the first battle every army must win, the Battle of Supply. Formerly of Red Oak, Iowa, he lives today in Los Angeles, California, where he is a sales representative for a national shoe firm. Today, Carl Sachs resides in Lakewood, California, and is engaged in landscaping. Formerly from East Prussia, he served with the Wehrmacht during World War II. First as a combat infantryman on the Eastern Front, and later with a quartermaster company in France. Once the Allies landed in France, it was like the last act in a play. All the action was moving to a climax, and everyone wanted the outcome to be in his favor. Across the war-torn landscape of France and Germany, Gerald Keane and Karl Sachs traveled much the same roads. Two fighting men, one American, one German, relive that moment in history. On July 25th, 1944, the Allied forces fighting in Normandy begin a massive offensive to smash out of the bitterly contested beachhead and thrust forward across the face of France to Germany. The Allies pour onto the beaches of Normandy more men and supplies, and additional men to handle their delivery and distribution. One of these soldiers is Corporal Gerald Keane. It's D plus six when we land at Omaha Beach. I'm in charge of four trucks. The roads aren't much. I'm in the rear truck with my 50 caliber machine gun, and we drive like we never drove before, because we're carrying gasoline. Everybody hits the road. Everybody's making sure his name isn't on any bullets flying around. While German defense forces fight the Allies on the beaches, supply units rush ammunition to the Normandy sectors. In one of these supply companies is Corporal Carl Sachs. Our company is made up mostly of veterans wounded previously on other fronts. We service the 1st Panzer Division, a division of the Hitler Youth. Compared to us, these young soldiers seem like children, but they are the ones holding the front line. Some soldiers were captured by the Americans, returned back through the lines this morning. The Americans sent them back, saying, go home, you are too young to fight. What the Americans don't know is that these boys are some of the most fierce troops we have. They are going back into the line, not home. Planes of the Allied Air Force bombed German positions along a narrow front at San Lo, opening the way for a rapid and powerful drive by American infantry and armored units. Dog faces appreciate everything the guys in the motor transport are doing. They always ask us, where are we heading for? But we can't tell them. They know there's trouble ahead, and nobody's happy about it. It's really rough hauling the troops up to the line and just leaving them. 
our losses have been heavy. And when we bring back the wounded, I can see the suffering in their faces. That expressionless, empty look. They're like zombies, most of them. It's pitiful what this fighting does to a human being. He'll never be the same man again. We finally reached St. Low, and it's a shambles. You can see it was once a pretty little city, but now nothing's left. We drive through slowly, and it's like passing through a bunch of broken tombs. We feed ammunition to our tanks and artillery from dumps set back in the forest, camouflaged with great care to avoid discovery by enemy aircraft. During the day, all movement is kept to a minimum, but at night, the area swarms with activity. Our truck drivers returning from the front give us bits of information about the fighting going on. The news is bad. Our troops are suffering heavy casualties from the enemy aircraft. And the wish of our soldiers is to see the Luftwaffe sweep the skies clean. But not one of our planes do we see. Spearheads now fan out, capturing Colletance and Avaranche in the south. The enemy fights tenaciously, but he is reeling from the power and speed of the Allied attack. By July 27th, complete breakout from the Normandy beaches has been achieved. The American 4th Armored Division advances 25 miles in 36 hours. The Germans retreat to regroup. Orders come for us to move our ammunition depot 10 kilometers to the rear. This alone is enough to tell us the fighting is going against us. No army likes to retreat. You drive back and wonder how much blood it will cost to retake the ground we are giving up so easily. General George Patton appears on the battle line as the commander of the new U.S. Third Army. A freewheeling, don't worry about the flanks combat leader, he is the ideal choice to exploit the breakout. He sends a strong spearhead force slashing toward the Seine. Within three days, his 15th Corps armored spearheads have wheeled as far east as Le Mans, deep to the rear of the German army. On August 6th, the Germans launch a desperate counterattack to break through to Avaranche and cut off Patton's rampaging 3rd Army at its base. There is much confusion between echelons here and at the front. From our truck drivers, we learn that shells of the wrong caliber were delivered to units on the line. Everyone suspects sabotage. But it is too late to do anything. The enemy has overrun our forward positions. Once more, we are forced to retreat. Pounded unmercifully by air bombings, artillery and armor, the Germans retreat in stunned disorder through a gap at Falaise. The commanders desperately urge their troops to hold open the mouth of the closing pocket. Their hope is to save their panzer divisions for a stand at the Seine River.
Eight infantry and two panzer divisions are captured, but over 49,000 combat troops managed to escape. Now the race to the Seine is on. Things are really beginning to move now. You can tell it by the abandoned trucks and destroyed enemy tanks along the roadside. Compared to our trucks, the German trucks look real ancient, and they haven't got near the goal. I wouldn't trade anything for this powerhouse I'm driving. We reach the Seine. Only few bridges are left and our whole army must cross over them. My company hides in the forest until it is time for us to cross over. Somehow we hope it will be possible to establish a defense once we are across the river. But from what I have seen, it does not seem that anything can stop the enemy. Numerous spearheads surge across western France, at times gaining as much as 50 miles in one day. Chartres and Orléans fall, and beyond the Seine, Paris. We drive through the city and see a lot of happy people, just like a holiday. Paris is a beautiful city, but we don't get much chance to enjoy it. Before we know it, we're on the go again. And then, Patton's gas runs out. The whole East advance comes to a halt. Patton orders part of his reserve force to drain their tanks and transfer their gas to attacking units. But even this expedient only brings limited gains. Now, for the first time, the Allies feel the frustration of supply limitations. There are virtually no stocks between Normandy and the small army dumps 300 miles away. Each allied army demands priorities for gasoline and lubricants, and a war of words develops between Patton and other army commanders for the lion's share of supply and transport. Never in the history of warfare has the importance of supply been better demonstrated, and he who would master this extended battlefield must first master his delivery of supplies. Without ammunition, without fuel, no battle can be planned, no advance can be made. August 1944. The Allied drive across France is halted as armored divisions outrun their supply lines. To get the attack moving again, the Red Ball Express is organized by the Allied command. The Army Transportation Corps, commanded by General John Lee, pulls all the available motor transport facilities into one organization called the Advanced Section Motor Transport Brigade. 141 truck companies, over 3,000 men, are committed to the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball plan calls for a looped, one-way traffic route stretching across northwest France from the supply depots to the fighting fronts and back again. Red Ball means fast through freight in the lingo of American railroaders. Traffic control points are established in all major towns to record the movement of convoys, check their destination, and determine their cargo. The supporting services have their job, too. Thousands of road markers are placed along 800 miles of roadway. The signal corps strings endless miles of telephone and telegraph wires. The lead truck usually sets a speed of 25 miles per hour. That seems very slow, but when you have trucks strung out over several miles, the last trucks really have to roll to keep pace with the convoy. That's when you really have to keep on the ball and really drive. 
they don't want any stragglers left on this road. with gas and ammunition, the American armored columns again surge forward. By August 29th, Patton's Third Army has crossed the Marne, captured Reim and chalon sur marne Patton now aims his armored spearheads toward Verdun, San Miel, and Combercy. But almost immediately, this new momentum by the advancing armies puts new strains and demands on the Red Ball Express. Relief drivers are urgently needed, and they are recruited from every outfit on the continent, even infantry units. Each truck is on the move 20 hours a day. It's drive, 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 night and day. Drivers fight exhaustion and accidents increase. so hard sometimes to keep your eyes open, especially at night. But you must have eyes in the dark, even when you're dead tired. We hear about guys getting killed from falling asleep, but we try not to think about it. You can't drive a tank without gas, and you can't fight without food and ammunition. And so we thank God for our good trucks and good drivers. Because without the Red Bull Highway, the courage on the front would die for sure. By August 29th, the Red Ball Express reaches peak performance. Almost 6,000 trucks deliver 12,000 long tons of supplies to the forward areas. The columns of prisoners marching rearward as the trucks move forward is proof that the Red Ball Express is paying off. While the Red Ball Express convoys work without let-up, a crucial meeting of Allied commanders takes place at Charter to determine disposition of supplies. General Eisenhower wants the major portion to go to General Hodge's First Army. Patton protests that his main force has been halted at the Meuse River for two days because of insufficient supplies. He wants more fuel so his tanks can break for the German border. He persuades Eisenhower to increase his allotments, saying, my men can eat their belts but my tank's got to have gas. Patton's Third Army thrusts armored columns across the Meuse River, capturing Verdun and Commercy. With astounding speed, they ford the Moselle River near Nancy and Metz. First, we wouldn't believe it. Then we found out it was true. An attempt was made against Hitler's life, and he was severely wounded. Our company is shocked and angered. Here we are fighting with our backs against the wall, and there is treachery at home. What are we coming to, we ask ourselves. I remember how peaceful the French countryside looked when I first arrived here. The same countryside is now a death trap. Every step of the way, French snipers fire on us constantly, and we must waste much valuable time to patrol against them.
British and the American First Army strike hard toward Belgium, devouring supplies with an insatiable appetite. But the Red Ball Express drivers bear the brunt of the stepped-up Allied advances. Accidents increase, and within one month, over 6,000 vehicles are serviced for major repairs. Replacements flow in, and tired and exhausted drivers are sent back to hospitals and rest camps. My truck is much like a woman, quite temperamental. I live with it. It's part of me. You don't just get in and drive. You have to know how it feels, what it's doing. And if you don't know how to handle it, you get into a mess of trouble. We always carry cigarettes and chocolate and stuff under our seats. And the French civilians know it. When the convoy slows down, they appear from everywhere. So we toss them mostly candy and some cigarettes. We are home again. But what sadness. The people are living in cellars like frightened animals. There is little to eat. The will to fight on is gone. But no one can say I quit. Our company is given more guns more trucks, and orders to move against the enemy again. In our hearts, we feel that none of us will survive this war. By September 5th, the original mission of the Red Ball Express is officially completed. Over 89,000 tons of supplies have been delivered to frontline armies an average of 7,400 tons a day. In 10 short days, this unplanned, improvised organization far surpassed the highest hopes of its inventors. It provided the energy for Patton's race across France and enabled Allied forces to strike at the Germans while they were still confused and disorganized. By winning the Battle of Supply, it helped win the Battle of France. In a moment, the conclusion of our story. After the German retreat from France, Karl Sachs fights in Hungary against the Russians. When Germany surrenders, he gives himself up to American troops in Austria. Gerald Keane participates in five major campaigns from Normandy to Germany itself before the war is ended. In November 1945, he returns home. By necessity, the Red Ball Express was continued beyond its initial mission. The Red Ball route was extended eastward through Versailles, and by the end of the pursuit in mid-September, it had delivered over 135,000 tons to the forward delivery areas. The Red Ball Express was an audacious gamble. It got Allied armies there fastest with the mostest.